Mr. Lord today. Um, I'm just getting some final things set up here, and then we're going to get started. So. Thank you for bearing with me just one moment while I make sure everything is set up all the way. Just gotta get some final things checked here. Thank you to anyone who's watching already and in the future <laughs> um, while I get things set up. Uh, all right, I think we should be good to go in just a moment. And just one last thing I need to check. Right. Hello. Okay. I think we're ready to get started now. So, um, today we are starting a different series um, called Yester Lore, um, and I'm going to explain what it's all about, and then um, we'll jump into what we're going to do today uh, once I do some announcements. So, what is Yester Lore? <laughs> Um, so Yester Lore is what um, I'm calling, currently we might change the name later, but um, I'm currently calling Yester Lore uh, just whatever random stuff we end up reading and looking at on Friday evenings. And what it's going to be is I'm going to be looking at ancient and medieval texts and we'll be doing something with them. It won't just be me reading most of the time. If that's something people want, I can read some old stuff, um, and that could be all it is. But in general, I would like us to do something a little bit more interactive with it. Um, so, um, the first thing we're going to do with Yester Lore is we're going to look at some Old English riddles. Um, so, first I'll give some announcements, and then I will explain what we're going to look at today, the riddles, where they come from, a little bit of historical context, and then we're going to jump into um, doing some riddles. So, um, first I'd like to give some announcements um, for, <laughs> um, I'm glad people are appreciating the fireplace um, gif. Uh, it's just to add to the atmosphere here. Um, so what this is, is we're going to be reading ancient and medieval texts and then um, doing something with them. Uh, today it's riddles. And uh, this is going to go from 5.30 p.m. Pacific to 8 p.m. Pacific, uh, so it's about two and a half hours. I started a little bit late today, um, but it will still end around 8 p.m. Pacific. Um, and so this will be Friday evenings. Um, we're going to do this as kind of a break from the conlanging that happens on Thursdays and Saturdays. Um, the next conlang with me is going to be tomorrow from 3.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. Pacific. So if you just go to my channel and look at my schedule, it'll be localized to your time zone if you're watching this um, from somewhere else or in the future. Um, uh, if there are changes and you're watching this in the future, then it should be updated for whatever the situation is then. Um, so that is my only really real announcement is tomorrow is the next conlang with me. Uh, we'll get back into, um, we'll do some review and then get into the next topic with conlang with me. But this is completely unrelated. So we're going to just go into 
some Old English stuff today. Um, so um, we are looking at Old English riddles. And Old English riddles are riddles which um, uh, people would have orally remembered most of the time and passed down, kind of in the way that jokes tend to be passed around nowadays. We have sort of um, standard known jokes. We also have, you know, unique jokes. People are always coming up with new jokes. Um, but things like knock-knock jokes are sort of a culturally passed down thing. Um, and there are other kinds of jokes, uh, joke formulae that people will use. And riddles um, seem to have been kind of similar, where people would um, have some that they remembered, um, where it's sort of, there will be word associations, descriptions of something, and you have to guess what it is. And typically, it's going to be something that um, is not the first thing you'd think of. So they might try to mislead you with the riddle um, by using a lot of metaphor. Ultimately, ultimately, it's about metaphor. So you're kind of metaphorically describing a thing as indirectly as you possibly can, <laughs> but still in a way where the person can guess what the riddle is. Um, so um, it, from the text that we have, it seems really clear that riddles were a very popular kind of entertainment in um, Anglo-Saxon in England from sort of the 700s to the um, uh, to about the year 1100. Um, if you're worried about how well you're going to do with the riddles, um, don't worry, because we're going to try to break it down together. Um, I'm definitely excited to see people in the chat trying to figure out what the answer is. But um, I'm, first I'm going to explain where we're reading these riddles from. So what we're going to be looking at is the Exeter book. Uh, that's E-X-E-T-E-R. Um, <laughs> Exeter. And it's a uh, codex. It's like a big document. This is a picture of one of the pages from it. I can't tell what exact part of that that is. Um, but what it contains are a bunch of poems, like a lot of very long poems uh, in Old English, ranging on all types of different topics, kind of biblical retellings in poetry, um, sort of Anglo-Saxon oral um, epic and elegiac poems, and it also has lots of riddles. There are 95 riddles in this book. Um, I don't think we're going to look at all of them. We're definitely not going to look at all of them today, but um, it was probably composed in the 900s, so it's going to be Old English, so the kind of English that you probably might have seen if you've ever looked at a facing page version of Beowulf. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just an entirely different language from modern English, uh, but you'll see there are some similarities with modern English. Um, and uh, uh, it is located, the reason it's called the Exeter Book is it's located in Exeter Cathedral in Exeter, which is a Devon in southwest England. And it was given to, I think it was given to that cathedral by uh, the Bishop Leovrich and... Um, uh, we don't know if that means that that's the person who composed it. Probably not. But um, some kind of Benedictine monk probably is the one who transcribed all these. Um, there's some evidence that it was written in late West Saxon dialect, um, but copied from an Anglian um, source. Anglian would be a different dialect of Old English because there's kind of some things from that dialect that come through. Um, so it seems like there were older versions that it was copied from, and those versions were probably just record, uh, sort of like written recordings of uh, what would have originally been recited by people, and the monks just decided to write it down, thankfully for us. Um, so uh, there's a bunch of poems, and then we get a big chunk of poetry. I think there's 50-something, um, and then there's more poems, like just more epic and elegiac poems and other writings, and then the rest of the poems up to like, 95 um, is at the end of the book. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at, um, I think we'll probably get through maybe three <laughs> uh, because of the sort of process I want to go through with these um, uh, riddles. Um, so the riddles um, are written in poetry. They're written in Anglo-Saxon alliterative verse. So um, they're going to be written in the same kind of poetic style that a poem like Beowulf was written in, 
Um, when I say written, I mean composed, because it was originally not written, but it was written down. So um, it's that same kind of poetry, but obviously different genre. It's not an epic, it's just riddles. It's just for fun. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to start with just the very first riddle, um, and then I think we're going to skip to... Oh, that's the wrong tab. That's calling with me. Um, we're going to sk skip to the third riddle, um, or I think it's actually the sixth riddle. The first three riddles actually have the same answer, <laughs> um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, then there's a few that are kind of tricky to get um, if you don't have more context. Um, so I think we're skipping to riddle six, and then we're going to skip... And then we're going to go to Riddle 7. Um, and we'll see if we can get through all of that. And if we can, then hopefully we can maybe start another one. Although I, I didn't prepare another one, so um, it'll be kind of more off the cuff. Um, so where are we in the text? So where we are is we're on... I'm going to zoom out a little bit, actually. Um, this is page um, 101 Recto. And what that means, when I say recto, is when we are talking about old manuscripts, um, unlike what we do with modern books where just each side of a page is labeled with a number, um, you know, this might be, if this were a modern book, this would be page, I don't know, 27, and you flip it to the next page, and that's 28. But what we do, because often there's, like, pages missing and or damaged or things like that, uh, what's useful for paleographers, uh, those are people who work with ancient texts, um, what's useful for them is to actually label uh, the pages by sheet. And so this would be sheet 101. So that's page, we might still say page 101, but sheet 101. And then there's two sides. There's recto and verso. And recto is um, the side where it's going to be on the right side of the book. Um, so we would say like the first page of the very, like the very first side of the first page in a book that's written from right, uh, from left to right is going to be recto, so it's like the first, the front side. And this over here, if you see the sort of side here, that's the verso of page 100. So this is 101 recto, uh, 100 verso. And then if we were to flip this to the other side of this sheet, you can kind of see it bleeding through a little bit actually from the ink, um, potentially, is that that would be 101 verso. But this is 101 recto, so that's the page we're on. And the database I'm using is um, uh, it's a digitization of the Exeter book uh, that's put together by the University of Exeter, which is really nice of them. So you can find this. Um, I can actually put the URL in the stream description once um, this is a video, once this is a VOD <laughs> on the um, on the channel. And then when I eventually upload it to YouTube, it will, the link, I'll also link it there um, so that you can potentially look through this manuscript if you want. Um, and I'm going single page view just because it's easier to zoom in, but we could do double page view too if we wanted. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and zoom in because um, this is where the first riddle starts. Um, the thing immediately before this is an elegiac poem. It's a very sort of sad, contemplative poem with a lot of mystery behind it because it seems to be a fragment. And it just ends right here with this word yador. Um, and then this little sort of like, uh, n this like random piece of punctuation that just says, we're starting a new poem here. Um, you'll see this poem, this first riddle actually ends here with these two dots and the like little squiggle here. Um, there's not really standard punctuation <laughs> in old manuscripts like this. You might see some dots um, that could be helpful, um, but most of you just kind of have to use the grammar and the syntax to figure out where things should end. Um, nowadays we tend to insert um, punctuation where we think it would be logical, but sometimes where you put the punctuation actually kind of changes your interpretation. And these poems, these riddle poems, are notoriously difficult from a sort of translation standpoint, um, which makes it a challenge, which is why I did a little bit of preparation for some of the trickier uh, words. Here, there are some words that are like, people still even debate what they exactly mean. So I wanted to do a little bit of preparation for these. But mostly, I'm just going to be trying to piece it together. I haven't read all of the riddles before. I've only read a few. And I definitely don't remember any of them by heart. And I didn't read any translations of this beforehand because I thought it would be more fun to try to piece it together on stream <laughs> um, and kind of show you my process for how I do that. Um, this stream is not going to teach you Old English. <laughs> um, if people want that, that's something I'm super down for. But I think there are some other people who are already doing that. Um, 
on YouTube and other places. And I would prefer you actually like check in, check out what already exists first because um, they have some cool stuff. I could probably link to some people who do old English lessons. Um, but um, if you have any questions as we go along, because I'm going to come, I'm going to kind of explain a lot of these words as we go. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask um, in the chat because uh, I'm very, 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 very happy to explain anything as we go. So um, the process that we're going to do is for a riddle, first I'm going to try to read it all the way through in Old English just so you can kind of hear how it sounds poetically. Um, so that will be kind of quick. Um, I am no Simon Roper, so my Old English pronunciation is not perfect. Definitely not. That's not my specialty. I'm not, I'm not trying to sound as authentic as possible. I would probably need to pick a dialect to emulate and work really hard at get, doing that. I'm just going to pronounce it as best I can, um, given very little preparation. I haven't like practiced <laughs> this at all. So um, it's going to be a little rough, but I will try to pronounce it so that you can hear sort of the cadence of the poetry. Um, and then we're going to go sort of looking at each word. I might explain some of the sort of font stuff going on, because this is definitely a very different way of writing letters than we do nowadays. Um, so I'm, I'll explain some of that as we go and um, sort of break down the words so we can kind of piece together what it says. And then we'll go over it a final time, a third time, just with the translation we're kind of putting together to see what the overall sort of meaning of the riddle is. And at that point, we could probably try to guess what it means, like what, what the answer to the riddle is. So I'm going to go ahead and start um, reading uh, the riddle. Sorry, I have a little bit, I just have some notes on history stuff over here I want to put away. <laughs> um, I might be looking at this too because there's some notes on some of the words that are tricky here. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start with the first riddle. All right. Quilch is halatha thas horsh an that hiya krafti thathat maya asejan. Uh, huamek on seed uraka. Thona each astia strong stundum. S uh, wait. Um, actually, I think I got the rhythm of that wrong. Okay, I'm gonna actually start again. Um, the thing that makes this extra tricky is they're writing poetry, but they don't actually put it on separate lines like we would now. <laughs> they just kind of keep going to save uh, space. So um, it could be kind of tricky to piece together where these pauses and stuff are. Okay, I'm going to start again. <laughs> um, all right. Quilch is halatha thas horsh an thas hia crafty that at maya asejan huamek on seed uracha. Yeah, that's uracha, actually, I think. Thone um, ich astia strong stundum breda thrimful thunia Thrawum Racha Thera Yon Foldan Folk Salo Barna uh, Ratched Ravia uh, Rekas uh, Rekas Stiath. I think that's what that is, yeah. Um, Haswa over Hrovum Hlin Bithon Earthan Wal Quelm Wera. Thona ich wudu hreda barwas bledhwata bames fella holma yehreved a hern. Oh, I think that should be an H. Herhum. Herhum machtum. Urekan on wada. Wida sended. Haba me on hrije that ar hadas that ar hadas urach fold buendra flash on gastas somod on sunda saga hua mek fetche other other who each heart fefa last bera okay. So that's, that's the whole riddle there in Old English. So we're going to break down what each part says. So first we have, I think the first half line, 
can kind of hear it with the alliteration that's going on here. You have Hulchich Halethas Thas Horsh and Thas Krafti. I think that's the first, that would be the first line. Um, so we've got uh, Hulch, which is where we actually get the word witch from. Um, witch, W H I C H. Um, but in Old English, it's Hulch. And this is actually a Y. I'm actually going to zoom in as we're going through, like, oh, whoa, not that much. So I want to see the whole line. Uh, whoa. Okay, this is, this is going to be tricky. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, here we are. Huilch is halatha thas horsh and thas crafty. So, huilch, this is a Y here. This scribe has a kind of interesting way of writing Ys. It's typical that they would try to write it with, like, one long stroke where they kind of bend and then go back up. Um, sometimes they bend and then curve back, almost like you're writing an upside down P or something, but that depends on the scribe. But this is a Y, and it makes the E sound, just huilch, huilch. Um, and this could be a question word, or it could be a, a sort of uh, indefinite whoever, or whichever, or it could be who or which. Um, and a lot of riddles are going to start with like a question word, because they're trying to see if you can figure out who, who or what it is um, that the riddle is referring to. Um, so, which is halatha thas hosh. So, a couple things you'll also notice is this this thing that looks like a P is actually not a P. <laughs> this is a letter that we call win, and it represents the letter W. Um, w was not really a common thing in Old English. Um, w used to just be two U's next to each other that people would use to make that sound. You see it in a lot of um, early German uh, texts. But in Old English, they actually used what was actually originally a rune that looked kind of like a, like a sort of sticky, like a P, but all the lines are straight. So it's kind of like a triangle and then like a vertical line that it's coming off of. Um, so it looks like a P, um, but that was a rune that they used to carve into things. Um, and it represented that W sound. So in Old English, they just kind of carry this into the writing. So otherwise, they're using the Latin alphabet, but they're using a couple of runes in their writing as well. And so win is one of those things. And it just represents W. The letter P is pretty pretty rare in Old English. It's not a common sound. Um, but when it is, the way that you can tell whether it's a P or if it's a win is that win just kind of slopes down and then like touches down to the line, whereas P will curl back up. It'll be more like a comp like attempting to be more of a circle um, that kind of bends back up when you have a P. Um, so it's pretty rare. Usually, if you see something that looks like a P, odds are it's actually a win. Now, um, there's a couple other things you might notice here. Uh, so this thing, this looks like kind of like a lowercase r in modern English um, handwriting. This is actually an S, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, this is actually kind of the ancestor to the long S that you might see um, in older, sort of if you're thinking about um, like uh, 18th century texts that you might have seen, like if you've ever looked at... Um, the Declaration of Independence or something, you might see some long S's, which are just, they kind of look like F's without the line. Um, but in Old English, they, they actually descended underneath the line, and they had this little hook at the beginning. So they look a lot like a lowercase r, but like one that has like a little tail that goes down. You see it again down here. This is the normal way of writing S in Old English manuscripts. So anytime you see that, that's an S. And then the um, you might have seen this A connected to an E. And you see it again here. A lot of the time, E's will actually go above the other letters on, like, the other sort of uh, lowercase letters, and especially if they attach to an A here. So this is kind of A-E together. That's the letter ash, and it just makes the A ah sound. So this is haletha, haletha. So which, um, the letter C sometimes sounds like a K, and sometimes it sounds like a CH sound, depending on sort of historical stuff that used to be there that was lost. Um, I'm not going to go into that whole explanation, but... Um, just know that C can be K, usually it's K, or it could be CH. Um, so here it's CH. Which is HALETHA. So it's A HALETHA. HALETHA. Now this symbol here is THORN. Um, so you might have seen this before. This is also a rune. It comes from a rune. It's like the TH sound. It can also be the ZZ sound. And actually, technically, this probably should be HALETHA here. Um, well, hello, check out. <laughs> um, so haletha, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't pronounce that because this this is between vowels. So if this sound is between vowels, 
it'll be a th, like a voiced sound, and if it's not, then it'll be a th. Um, you might also see this D with the line through it. This is um, an ev. It's, it's um, also makes the th sound. Um, <laughs> I am indeed live right now. Thank you, chat. Okay, um, so uh, this sound, this symbol, and this thorn symbol can, are used interchangeably in Old English. They could both make the th or th sound depending on where in the word they are. So you kind of just have to look at where it is in the word and treat them as the same. They both make the th or the th sound. In modern Icelandic, however, this always makes the the sound. Like it sounds more like a D, so I read it like a D. And then this always makes the th sound. So there is a distinction in Icelandic, but that did not exist in Old English. You just have to use the context to figure it out. But scribes would switch back and forth between them. It doesn't really make a difference which one they use. So this here is seeth, seeth. We have S, I, and then this th, but it's at the end of a word, so it's going to be a th sound, not a th sound. So here's halada. And then we have the thorn again, we have an ash, and we have the S. And then we have this word, which is hosh. So this is S, C. Now, I said before that C can make a ch sound. When it has an S for it, though, it ends up making a sh sound. If it's a K, if it's like a C that doesn't make a K sound, then together they're going to make a sh sound. So this is hosh. Um, now, here, this is an R. <laughs> as much as it might look like kind of an open P, this is an R. Uh, this thing that looks like an R is an S, and this thing that looks kind of weird, um, it almost looks more like an N, but the first kind of vertical line goes down. You see it over here again. This is an R. Yeah, the S the S is pretty weird. Also, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to ask. Um, but yeah, so S, this is S, and then this is R, and of course this is Win, and this is Thorn. And these A, E together is ash. So, so far we have which is halida thas horsh and thas hiya crafty. That's the first line. And I'm going to start translating now. So we have which, which, and is, I-S. That's just is. Same as modern English. It just is spelled differently. So we're saying like what thing or which thing is. And then we have halida thas horsh. Um, this is where we get into how weird Old English word order can be, especially when we're in poetry. Uh, with poetry, we kind of are trying to have things line up where they need to go for the alliteration to work. So um, you can't really rely on word order to tell you what things mean. You kind of have to rely more on other grammatical things. And this is why Old English can be pretty hard to learn sometimes, especially if you're working with poetry. Um, sort of more prose texts will look a lot more like modern English word order. But here, um, is it spelled horsh? Yeah, so this is O-H-O-R-S-C. So S-C together makes the sh sound. This is something that happens in Italian before I or E. Um, in Old English, it happens when a C is pronounced like ch, if you put an S before it. Um, yeah. Yeah, you use S-C for the sh sound. Um, so, for example, shall, I don't think there is one in this. Um, I don't think there's any sh other sh in this poem, uh, in this uh, riddle poem. But um, in general, like shall, like the word shall that we have now, uh, it's S C E A L, typically shall. Uh, shall. So uh, the S C is going to make the S H sound in modern English. Um, so uh, let me interpret some of these words so we can piece together what this first line says. So. Which is just which. Which is. So which is. We're saying which thing because we're asking a riddle. What is this thing? And then we have Haletha. And this is Haleth. Haleth means like warrior or um, hero or something. It's mostly used in poetry to talk about, you know, your protagonists in the story or warriors in the story. Um, but this isn't a story. This is a, this is a riddle. So why are we bringing up warriors? Um... And this A at the end, Haletha, is a form of Haleth that means sort of of all of them. So this would be of warriors. And then we have Thas. And Thas means like of this or of that, um, uh, depending on what we're describing here. Thas, um, it's like of that. It's the genitive singular uh, is what this is called. And then we have Horsh. And Horsh is actually an adjective. It means wise or prudent. Um, and then we have, um, so 
nothing's making sense thus far because the word order is not sort of what we'd expect. So, so far we just have which is of warriors or of heroes of that wise, <laughs> which that's hard to put together yet. So we're going to have to keep going to make some sense of it. Then we have this thing that looks like a seven. Now this is the old way to abbreviate the word and. Uh, so you pronounce this and. And there's no there's usually no space between it and the next word. You just go and and then write the next word. So we have fast again here. Fast and then we have and fast. So this seven boy here is how you say and. It's kind of like their version of the ampersand. It's really funny too because on QWERTY keyboards in North America at least, um, the ampersand is what you get when you press shift seven. But in Old English, um, and in a lot of medieval texts actually, um, especially Irish Irish texts, in, actually in Irish they still use this for and, um, for August is what it is in Irish. Um, it, it's, that's just their ampersand there. So, and, so it's and, fast, hiya crafty. And this is probably a compound here. In modern English, or in modern sort of spelling of this, we probably not put a space here. Hiya crafty. Hiya means mind or thought. And crafty means crafty or skillful in some way. So this is crafty. So let me explain these letters because these look kind of different from what we're used to. So in hiya, this is a Y again. It's kind of these little truncated Ys here. And then this little swirly thing, it almost looks like a cursive Z. That is how you write a G. But you might have heard I pronounced it like it was a Y. Hiya. And that's because G has a lot of different pronunciations depending on where it is in the word and what's around it. Um, so a lot of the time before a uh, vowel like E, um, especially between vowels that are kind of in the front of your mouth, uh, like E or E, hie, uh, it's going to sound like a Y. But it kind of, it's like this swirly, swirly thing. That's a G. And you see it again over here in crafty. Um, now, so we've got the C, we've got the weird looking R that kind of looks like an N. We've got the ash, and then we've got F, and F looks really strange, um, probably to modern readers, because it, it has like a little start thing, like a lowercase r would, and then it descends rather than going up above, it goes down below, typically. Um, crafty. And this T looks kind of weird too. It kind of curves like it, as if it's a C. It's like a C with a little hat on, basically. Um, and what you'll also notice in crafty, and I didn't point it out with is either, actually I forgot, is that you don't dot I's in Old English texts. Uh, dotting I's is something that came much later, um, uh, sort of in the Middle English period. Uh, that wasn't really a common practice before. Um, so I's are not going to be dotted uh, most of the time. Now we've got another G here, so crafty. And again here, the, the G is kind of like a Y. In modern English, we just spell it with one Y. We don't even bother with the G. Um, so it's crafty. So he a crafty. Uh, skillful in mind. So we've got what thing is we've got prudent or wise and we've got skillful in mind. These kind of sound like synonyms. Um, so what thing is among something or of something? Oh, we've got fast and then we've got among warriors, among heroes. Um, wise and uh, skillful in mind. Okay, so still not really clear on what this is that we're trying to figure out uh, here. And then we have the rest of the sentence, which goes on to the next line. That, that, Maya, um, I said, John. <laughs> so um, this goes on to the next line, but there's more symbols to explain here. We've got this thorn which is different. Uh, yeah, G looks so weird in some fonts just because G has looked so different throughout history <laughs> for different reasons. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is kind of like where the two-story G comes from. Um, if we look at some, if we ever look at some old Norse texts, I suspect we will, you'll see like they, they usually have like a one-story G, but it kind of looks curved in a way where you can see where the two-story G would come from it. Uh, when I say two-story G, that's more like the circle one with the little hook thing that looks a lot like this. And then one story G is kind of like the one that looks like a backwards, like a, it looks like a Q, but that it curves. 
Um, that's what I mean when I say one story and two story G. Um, so we have this thorn here, but this thorn has a line through it. And this is another abbreviation, just like this one was and. This is an abbreviation for the word fat. But then we also have fat right here. Um, so why, why spell it twice? Well, because one fat is going to refer to one thing and the other fat is going to refer to another thing. Um, it's just a thing that happens in uh, Old English sometimes. Um, so we're going to have to break down the sentence more to understand what is going on. But we have fat, fat. So there's an abbreviated fat, and then there's a not abbreviated fat. And then we have this word maya. Uh, so this is that, that. This is where that comes from. But that meant a lot more things in Old English. Um, uh, then we have maya. And here, maya, maya just means may, like, you know, it is possible. Uh, it also means what most of the uses of can mean nowadays, like to be able to do something. Um, the word can itself comes from a different word in Old English that means something more like to be, like have the skill to do something or to know how to do something. Um, so whenever um, a teacher tells you to, um, if you say, can I go to the bathroom, and they say, no, you should say may. Well, may used to mean can, so um, I don't know <laughs> how um, correct those um, pedantic teachers were, um, because in Old English, may used to mean can. So, uh, so there. <laughs> um, and then we have this word, a said John. So, a, and we've got that weird looking S thing, said John. So here we have a C and a G next to each other. And here's another weird thing in Old English. C and G next to each other makes a J sound most of the time. Sometimes it makes just like a G, like a hard G sound. But usually it makes a J sound. C, G is J. Just that's the thing that we have to be used to. A se jan means uh, say. Um, it's just kind of got this extra emphasis mark for a to like to a say. <laughs> um, and so it's sort of like to say forth or something like that. A lot of times, Old English will just kind of have prefixes that can slightly alter the meaning, but they would translate the same in modern English. There's just kind of a different flavor to it. Um, so, so far we've got which, which is of, among, or of the, <laughs> we've got of the wise and mind crafty among warriors that that may um, may say and this may is actually in the subjunctive mood which just means that it's uh, it's a hypothetical may and may is already hypothetical this is extra hypothetical because it's in a different mood um so we'll have to still keep going to figure out what this really says um then we have hua so again this is a win so it's a wa. so hua mek on sieve Racha. Wa make on seed racha. Um, so wa can mean who or can mean what if the what in question is like a masculine or feminine noun. Because Old English had gendered nouns. Um, it just also had um, three genders. So there were masculine nouns, feminine nouns, and neuter nouns, which were usually kind of um, neutral or um, inanimate things, but we also had inanimate things that are masculine and feminine. Most, like, I think the majority of nouns in Old English tended to be masculine, but there were a lot of feminine nouns as well. Um, so we have hua or who, who or which, if we're talking about a thing, which, and mech, and mech is just me. It's me as an object, a direct object. And this is one of the things that tells us this, this probably was ori originally Anglia um, in that dialect me was, if it was a direct object, it was mech, uh, and if it was an indirect object, it was, object, it was me, like to me or for me, it was me, whereas in West Saxon, which is the sort of spelling that they're trying to go for here, um, it would be me either way, uh, which is where we get the word me from. We don't really have a descendant of mech anymore, but it still means me. We translate it as me in modern English. Who, me, and then we have on seed, uh, on seed, uh, so, uh, notice I kind of have a space here, on, seed. There isn't a space here, but I just know that this is a preposition on, because um, I know that on, seed isn't a word. Um, seed means like journey or travel or um, quest, um, depending on the context. Um, so, on a quest. Um, and then, uracha 
is again a hypothetical form of the verb so it's like might do this verb and this verb is reckon and reckon is where we get the word wreck from w-r-e-c-k um in old english it's w-r-e-c-a-n reckon uh but in this form where it's racha it is it means um may do it and reckon means to drive or to urge someone it can also mean to destroy which is where we get the modern sense of wreck um but um it it's actually more more accurately the the origin of wreak like when you wreak havoc w-r-e-a-k-k um is kind of more close to this original word um but um basically in this context in most contexts it just means to urge or to drive someone to do something so who may who may urge me on a journey or a quest so okay this is where i think it's safe to say the first sentence probably ends um like grammatically or we could we could put a comma here um but i think given what's next i think this is a good place to pause and go back over so which thing or what what is um of wise and um mind crafty or um skillful in mind among warriors that um may um that that may say um so that doesn't really quite make modern english sense um but it probably makes sense in old english um if if i had more time and wasn't doing this off off the cuff i would probably try to smooth that out a little bit better but we're just trying to get the gist here so what is it something that is you know wise and prudent of among warriors that that may say um who or which urges me which might urge me on a journey or a path or a quest or something uh so i guess we still have to keep going to get some sense out of this so then we have thonne and how do i know this thonna we see thon here but there's this line over the o that tells me that there's another n here and this is a way to abbreviate the word thun uh it's thorn o n n e if we were spelling it all out without an abbreviation so whenever you see a line over a vowel in this old english old english text or actually most old um like medieval european texts that use the latin alphabet this usually means there's some kind of nasal that's getting skipped over um so in this word i know it's an n so it's thonne because i know that's a word thonne means then or when when i'm kind of relating two things like this happens when this happens um it's one of the ways to say when and this is where the word then comes from thun um then uh and you see it over here too and here it's going to actually be an m that's missing because this is stund uh and i know that because this ending um is a really common grammatical ending that um, indicates something useful here that we'll go over when we get there so we have thun which is going to be like then or when probably when if we're like com- continuing from the same idea so it's like who sends me or urges me on my journey or on a journey when and then we have each astia and here the s looks a bit different than we've been seeing we've been seeing the s goes down but when there's a t after it uh we do what's called a ligature where um instead of having to like write the s and then write the t they want to just not have to lift the pen so they go down to write the as if they're going to write the weird s like you go down here and then back up but they go down and they go super back up because then they're going to write the top of this t and then curve it like they do with the c so it's like down up a little extra high so you can write the top of this t and then curl it so that's in one kind of elaborate stroke you've written an st here and this is astia so that's a g again astia and that means um to rise to go up stian is to go up and this is another sort of emphasis ah upwards to go upwards so when i so each here here's another c that makes a ch sound like in which uh each astia so when i go up um and we have strong strong s t r o n g and that's just strong <laughs> actually that's just the word strong when i go up strong okay uh not sure what that means yet 
but it should make sense soon. And then we have Stundum. Stundum. Um, so that's another ST com combination, and then we have it UN, and then we have this is a D. <laughs> Looks like kind of like an O with a curly thing, but think of it as like the T or the D. <laughs> I feel like go up strong. Yeah, so true. Um, uh, uh, so this D is kind of like it's been rotated a little bit. Like you have a D and it's just kind of tilted a bit. And that's how they write Ds. And some scribes write, they still have the D kind of go above a little bit at an angle. Kind of like this is, this like the thing, this th goes at an angle. A lot of scribes write their Ds that way. That's how I write my Ds, honestly. Um, but sometimes they like really like to keep it on the sort of half height here with the other ones, which makes it a little bit harder to read, but that's still a D that you've rotated. I tend to think of D in Old English scripts as kind of like a backward six with like a little loopy curve to it. Um, and that's kind of what this is, like a little backward six. So that's D. So this is stundum. It has that little line that tells us that there's a nasal. And then reda. Um, and I think that's where the the line ends, just because of the alliteration here. Uh, th uh, so the first half of the line was thona ich astia strong. So you have a stia and strong. So that's a stista. And then stundum is our third one, because we usually have two or three, but no more uh, alliterations. And then we need one more sort of half of that line, so reda. And reda means fierce or fiercely. So when I go up strong, fierce or fiercely, and then stundum means um, a stund is like an hour or a period of time. Uh, we don't really have this word anymore. It would be stound if we still had it. I think some dialects of English might have this, but not. it's not standard by any means. And stundum means it makes it plural and dative. So that means it's like at times or in times or with times. So this would be like sort of on hours or at hours or at whiles. Um, and we'll actually see at whiles a bunch in the later ones that we're going to look at. Um, so stundum is at times, or it could mean again uh, in some in some places. So when I go up strong, fiercely, um, again, <laughs> or um, yeah, no, I can't agree with stundum. We need to have a different meaning. So um, when I go up strong, um, at times, fiercely. Okay, so so it's a thing that's wise and skillful in mind among men, or maybe it's the thing that the skillful and, um, and wise among warriors may say. So the wise, the wise one, the wise ones, people who are smart, maybe people who can solve the riddle, um, people who are smart among warriors, <laughs> among us, hopefully. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, may say, uh, who, whoever this is, and it's the one who, who urges me on a journey when I go up strong um, at times fiercely. So now we're going on to the next, um, the next part. So we have thrimful thunia thraum racha. So we have racha again, so that's like urge, and it's that hypothetical form like may urge or may push me forward. Um, so here we've got thrimful. So thrim means um, like splendor or glory. Uh, so if something is thrimful, and it's that same full that we have in modern English. If something's thrimful, it's full of glory. Gloryful, wonderful, um, or powerful. Um, thrim is just any kind of splendor. Uh, so thrimful, thunia. Thunia uh, means this is still the same kind of form of the verb as we had astia. So we can kind of transport this each down here too. Again, Old English grammar is a bit different. So we can kind of have a verb without the subject if the form tells us who the subject is. So I go up strong at times fiercely, um, you know, gloryful, th uh, wonderful, thunia. So I thunia. And thun, uh, thunia, um, I believe this is, <laughs> um, I believe this is uh, a verb that means the same thing as thunria. If this were thunria, I think that's the more standard word for this. But it means to thunder as a verb. So when I thunder, <laughs> when I thunder, um, glorious or gloryful or wonderful, 
uh, when wonderful. So when I go up strongly, a uh, time spheres full, I thunder splendorfully, <laughs> maybe. Um, I don't think this is an adverb, but it might be. Um, I would expect an E here if it were an adverb, but maybe it'll make more sense if we keep going. Then we have thragum uracha. So again, uracha was may urge me. And thragum, thrag is another word for time. So again, this would kind of be like at times or again. Uh, when it urges me again, and it's probably again because we're repeating the verb. So uh, when it urges me on that more times. Um, so who urges me on a journey when I go up strong um, at times fierceful, um, I thunder. Um, uh, yeah, I thunder glorious um, at times. Um, may, may urge, <laughs> um, and then we have um, fera yon folm folk salo barna. Okay, so fera here means to go or to journey. This is where the word fare, f a r e, comes from. When you fare, like how do you fare, or we might say farewell. That means journey well, like go on a journey. Um, when we pay bus fare, <laughs> we're paying for our journey. <laughs> so feran is the verb here for to journey, and this is just I, this is the I form again. I journey, yond foldan folk salo barna. Okay, so yond is, uh, it sounds like yond, and it can mean beyond, or through, or along, depending on what comes after it. Um, I think this is going to be sort of more like over, or, or through. Um, and foldan, fold means earth, folda is earth. Like the land, the fold. Uh, foldan, folk salo barna. Okay, so folk salo. Folk means folk. Um, it's just spelled with a C instead of a K. Salo, um, so a sal, a sal is a hall. So this is like the folk hall and it's plural. The O is telling us that it's plural. So um, I journey over the land. Um, the the folk halls barna. So this is the verb barnon, which means burn, to burn. So this is I burn. Um, so let's go back a little bit. So who sends me on my, uh, who may urge me on a, on a journey when I go up strong at times fierceful um, uh, with splendor <laughs> I thunder um urged or maybe I urge at times or I'm urged at times to um, I journey over the land and I burn the the folk halls the people's halls and then we have this next line ratched ravia rekas stiath <laughs> um, I, I, I can assure you I'm not making this up, but if I were, um, thank you for being willing to fight for me. Okay, um, so, um, ratchet is another word for building, so it's like a structure, ratchet, and reavia, uh, this is to reave, we don't really use this word anymore, but it means to plunder, so I plunder the structure, the building, and then we have rekas stiath. So this is that same verb that we had before when we said astia, I go up. So stiath is goes up. And rekas, rekas mean reeks, reek as in smell bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, in Old English though, rek, rek mean, just means smoke. Um, so reeks are smokes. Um, and over time, the meaning has kind of shifted from smoke to smell like odor in the air but it still has to do with like odor coming off of things it just used to mean smoke so um you know i thunder <laughs> at times uh, so it urges me on at times i journey over the land i burn uh the folk halls um i plunder the, the structure the building um smokes go up Hazwa over 
Okay, so this is another um where we're writing the M with like a line over the previous vowel. So ha, uh, hazwa, hazwa means it could be like anything between like lavender color and gray, grayish color. Probably gray here because we're talking about smoke. So hazwa would be like gray um, over over um, here in Old English F. And you might have heard it when it did uh, reavia too. When an F is between vowels, it's going to sound like a V. Same with S. If S is between vowels, it's going to sound like a, a, a Z. And thorn, or F, when it's between vowels, it's going to sound like a Z rather than a Th. What's, what's happening there is it's called intervocalic voicing. Between vowels, these consonants get more vibration because vowels vibrate, so these are vibrating in turn. So here we have hazwa, and it sounds like I'm saying a, a Z there. Um, and we already have this in modern English to an extent. We say rise, and we spell it with a Z. We spell it with an S, but it sounds like a Z. Um, that's pretty much always the case in Old English. Um, so we have hazwa, which is like that gray color. Over, which is just as over or above. Rovum. And this is the word rov, and it's just plural. Um, so it's over the roofs. So rov means roof. Um, we've just lost the H at the beginning of roof. Um, so Rolf means roof. So, so now that we're saying like I, I go over the land, um, I burn the people's uh, halls, the buildings I plunder, um, smokes rise um, gray over the roofs. Um, then we have Plin. Whoa, I did not mean to zoom out there. To, I do have to zoom out just a bit. Okay. Then we have Hlin Bith on Erthan. Um, so Hlin. Hlin is a word that um, people debate about because we're not really sure where it comes from or what it means. <laughs> um, so this is tricky. But um, two ideas that people have. One uh, is that it means a torrent or um, some like powerful movement or it can mean a din so like a really loud clamorous sound um so like something harsh some kind of commotion of some kind um but there doesn't seem to be a like a root for that that, that would come from so um it's just kind of mysterious but from context that's what people have guessed it means uh, the other idea is more based on what it might be related to so there is a verb hlinian in old english but that means to lean um to lean to one side. Um, that's actually, I think, where we get the word lean. Um, or at least it's related to lean distantly. It's also related to, like, recline. The cline in recline or incline. Uh, that k becomes the h in Old English. So it's a lean. Um, but uh, lean doesn't really make sense in context. So I'm, I'm more of the opinion that it does mean torrent, and we've just lost whatever the root is. So in any case, lean bith on erthan. Some kind of commotion is, so we have bith here. Bith means bith, so it's another way of saying is. There are some slight different connotations between is and bith, uh, but we don't have to talk about that today. That's not super important. Um, uh, so hlin bith on erthan. Uh, there's a commotion is on erthan. So erthan is earth. Um, that looks like earth. It's just E-O-R, thorn, and erthan. Um, so there's a commotion on the earth, on the land. Uh, because of all this stuff that's happening, you know, fire's going up. And then we have this word, walqual. Walqual. So qual actually means death. It's related to kill, distantly. Qual, um, a death, and wal means battle. So battle death, it could also mean sudden death, <laughs> um, just because of the emphasis of the battle and the death here. And then wera. So this wer, this wer, this a is the same as the one in halada, where it means of multiple. So of multiple wers, and wer, um, win er, means man, and it's the same where that's in the word werewolf, like a were, as in a person, wolf as in a wolf. So where just means man, um, and it usually has gendered connotations, like so, so among men. Although in Old English, like we've seen with like halada, which means of warriors or of heroes, often it also means men. That's sort of men taken as the default in Anglo-Saxon culture, um, because patriarchy. So that's that's why that. Whenever you see men 
you can just kind of re replace it with people, and it basically means the same thing most of the time. Um, so we've got Wera here. Uh, so sudden death of, um, of men. <laughs> uh, so we're just still describing some horrible stuff that's happened. So the wise uh, among heroes uh, may guess or may say, what is, like, what, what am I? <laughs> Which is it that the wise and, you know, mind crafty among people say who urges me on a path uh, when I rise up strong, uh, you know, at times fierceful, I thunder strongly, <laughs> mind crafty, not mind crafty, no, that would be cool though, um, I thunder powerfully, um, uh, at, like, you know, urged, like, we have kind of competition here, at times urged on, I fare, I journey over the land, I burn the people's halls, I plunder the building, uh, smokes rise gray over the roofs, uh, that's some nice imagery there, um, commotion is upon the earth, um, sudden death of men. All right, then we have thona again, then or when, Thona ich wudu hrera. So this is again, um, <laughs> uh, uh, when I, so this thona ich when I wudu hrera. So wudu means wood, as in like a wood or a forest. Wudu. Um, so we have the win, we have you, we have this, you know, really weird looking D, and then another U. Wudu. So, that, so that's wood or the forest, the woods. Uh, when I woods, and then hrera is our verb here. It means to stir. Hreran is to uh, stir or disturb. So it's when I stir the woods. <laughs> All right. Um, when I stir the woods, then we have barwas bledwata. And notice I went just straight on to the next line. Because in Old English, if, you know, a word breaks across the line, they didn't really use a dash. You just kind of gotta pray and hope that most of your words will be on one um one line but often they're not so i just happen to know that this is a word i know that was by itself doesn't really make sense and bad doesn't make sense but there is a word bad was here um and what that means is um like shh, um, i want to get this right it's um a bad was a badwa, it's not a barrow. There is a word badwa that means barrow, which is like a hill where you've buried someone. Um, but this is badwa, which means, I think, like a grove. Uh, so like a grove of trees, because we're talking about woods, so that makes sense in context. Badwas, so this is like groves of trees. And then bledhwata. Um, so this is just the plural of the adjective bledhwat. Bled means a shoot or a sprout or some kind of growing thing. Um, and then hwata means or it, it would just be hot if it were singular, would just mean quickly. So quickly shooting, quickly sprouting. So when I stir the woods, the quickly sprouting groves, um, then we have bamas filla. So bamas, uh, this is where we get the word beams from, but bamas means um, trees. So a bam is just a tree. It could also be just like the, the trunk of the tree. Um, or it could be the mast of a ship. Um, and in modern English, we just use beam for any kind of long, like, sturdy, towering kind of thing. Um, or usually beams are, like, at the top of houses that keep sort of the roof together. Uh, they're called beams because they're usually from, like, one long tree. Um, or the mast of a ship is usually, like, you, you know, usually coming from a tree. Um, but we've also, we also talk about beams of light and stuff, kind of metaphorically. Uh, but it originally just means tree, and it's related to the word Baum in German, which means tree. Um, and then this is Fille, and that, I regret to inform you, is also a Y. So we've seen kind of how weird Ys look here. It kind of curves, almost like a little lowercase r. This is curved, and it kind of loops over, almost like it looks like another F. So this is an F, and then this... This thing it looks kind of like another F. That's actually a Y. Uh, sometimes Y's just kind of curl that way too. It's just the handwriting of the scribe that does that.
but um, I can tell that it's a Y <laughs> because of the way that it's leaning. Ys tend to kind of slant a little bit to the side and curve like that. There's also no other letter that tends to be written this way. Um, and I also know the word, <laughs> fila, and that just means full as sort of an adjective here. So full trees, trees that are blooming full. So we've gone from sort of, you know, burning buildings, <laughs> kind of negative stuff to like, when I stir the woods, the quick sprouting um, groves, the full trees. Um, so when I stir them, whoever, whatever thing it is that we're talking about. With these kinds of riddles, usually the thing that you're supposed to guess is the one speaking. So whatever the answer is, the answer is the one telling us this riddle. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, um, burning buildings are not necessarily negative, <laughs> depending on the building especially. But um, I, I'm not going to go ahead um, and condone arson on this channel. We do not condone that here. But... Um, uh, in any case, whatever it is that's telling us what it is, um, it, you know, sweeps over the land, um, burning buildings, <laughs> plundering, um, you know, smokes go up gray over the roofs, the tumult or, um, you know, commotion on the earth, the sudden death of men. But then, <laughs> um, then I, um, stir the woods. Um, the quick sprouting groves, the full trees. Then we have um, <laughs> Holma Yechrevet. Um, and Holm means, um, uh, Holm is like waves, um, a, a wave. Holm originally meant like a hill, but it kind of, um, in poetry, tends to re describe waves instead, because they, they also kind of undulate like a hill might. So Holma Yechrevet. Um, so upon the wave, yechreved, yechreved means roofed as an adjective. It's a past participle, actually. So roofed, um, roofed over, or like roofing, or roofed the waves. Um, and then this, it looks like it says hanum, mahtum. And again, this is like, it just goes on to the next line, but I know the word, so it's mahtum. Um, it, this is an N, clearly. But I think this is a scribal error, a typo, because um, uh, I think there is a word han, but it doesn't make sense here. Uh, so hanum. Um, I think because we're talking about trees and like being over the waves, um, this is probably hahum, which means high, high above, like up. Hah, H-E-A-H, is high. Um, in modern English, we have that G-H in it, and that's because of this H that used to be here. Um, but I think what happened is the scribe who was copying it, um, maybe the last person they were copying from didn't write their H very clearly, and it looked kind of like an N, so the scribe wrote an N. Or the scribe just kind of was going fast and was like, oh, they just kind of didn't complete their H or something. Um, because Hanum doesn't make sense here. So I'm going to guess that that's Hahum. And it makes sense. Mehtum, M-E-A-H-T-U-M. Mehht means might, like mighty. And again, might has a GH because there used to be an H there. It was like the H sound that I'm making. Machtum. So high, um, in high might or something like that. So uh, roofed over uh, over the wave, high, like of high might or of great might um, or high power or by the high powers. Rekan on wada. Rekan, this is that verb, rekan again, to... Um, to urge or to drive um, on wada. And wada here, this is another on with no space, but it should be a space. Wada means, uh, so that's that's kind of a, a dative of just the word wath. Wath can mean wandering or roving, or it can mean hunting as a noun. So urged onto or into wandering. Well, so urged into wandering by like the mites of high things. So above, you know, roving or roofed over a wave high of high mites um, or by high might um, to urge on a wandering or hunting. Um, and then we have this next part, which is 
uh, we the sended. So this is W or not W, but win, which is the W sound. Um, I D E we the, and that means widely. It's just W I D E. Um, without the E, weed means wide, and then we the means widely as an adverb. So widely, and then sended, and that's just the past of. Uh, the past participle of send. So that's sent. Sent widely. So urged on a journey, sent widely. Those are kind of ways of rephrasing the same thing. You'll notice Old English poetry likes to kind of re reword what it just said a lot of the time, mostly to fill out the, the poetry so that things sound nice. Even if it sounds repetitive, it's kind of hammering it in. We descended. So where are we? So, so far, let's kind of go back because we're almost done with this uh, first riddle. So let's go back and see what we have so far, um, what things mean. We've got, uh, which is halatha thas horsh and thas hiya crafty, that that maya asseja. So which thing of the something that's not in this sentence, we might have to infer that there's some other thing that we're talking about. Which is, so which thing is, um, is it that um, the wise or mind crafty, mind crafty <laughs> um, among warriors, that um, what is it that that way that that may say or may name? Um, uh, so what is it? That, this is another way of saying like say solve this riddle. If you're smart, solve this riddle. <laughs> um, smart people will be able to solve this riddle. So try. Um, and what, what is it? So who am I? Who is speaking? Who may, um, who may urge me on a path or a journey when I go up or when I rise up strongly, um, at times fiercefully, I thunder gloriously, and at times urge on, I go over the, the lands, I burn the houses of the folk, or the, the halls of the folk. Um, I plunder the building. Smokes rise up gray over the roofs. Commotion on the earth. Uh, commotion is on the earth. Sudden death of men. Then I stir the woods, or when I stir the woods, um, uh, quick sprouting or quick growing groves, full trees, um, holma yerevit, so that's, um, roofed over the wave, or on the wave, um, by the high powers, by the high mites, uh, to urge on um, a wandering sent widely. Okay, so we might be putting together what things this could be, but we're not done yet, so let's not try to guess yet. Let's get the full picture with the last few lines here. So we have Habba me on Rija that er hades ureag fold buendra flash and gastas. Somod on Sunda and I think we'll, we'll stop there. So I know that's a lot, but I think that all goes together as one sentence, honestly. I think it goes as one sentence to the end. So let's just break this into pieces. Haba me on hrije. So haba is the, the same form of the verb that we've been looking at, the I form, because it's so, the answer to the riddle is telling us this stuff. We're imagining whatever object or thing it is that the, is the answer can speak, and it's going to tell us the hints. So I have me, so that's like to me, me, because if it were just me playing, it would be mech. So I have on me or in me or to me, on hridge, and hridge, um, this is where we get the word ridge from, we just don't have the H at the beginning, but the CG here is making that J sound again like it did in Sejan to say. Hridge means um, back, like your back, um, the back of your body. So hridge um, means back, and it's where we get ridge from uh, because they were imagining like your spine um, as your ridge. Uh, it's like, you know, there are ridges on your spine, we would say in modern English. So the word kind of shifted to just mean any ridge, but in Old English it meant 
primarily back, like someone's back. Um, so I have on back to me. Um, so this is weird grammar from modern English perspective, but this basically says I have on my back. But instead of saying on my back, they say I have on the back kind of of me in a way. Like I have on me on the back. And we're just supposed to understand that the back is me. So I have on my back. Um, uh, actually, that might not make sense. Actually, I don't think this is I have. I think because have that can also be the the subjunctive of to have. So it could be may have. Actually, that makes a little bit more sense. So here we don't have a subject, but it's basically or maybe that here. This is that again. This abbreviation for that. Uh, that might be the subject here. Okay, let's just keep going. So have me on the back or a back. That fact ar ar ash r um, means before or f once, like b before or at one time in the past. Um, it can also mean first in some contexts, but ad it's where we get the word air e r e, which is a very rare word nowadays, but it means before. Um, ad hades urach um, fold buendra. So had. Actually, this is where the word hood comes from, H-O-O-D. But in Old English, it can mean a, an awful lot of things. It can mean condition. It can mean shape. It can mean form. Um, like, we use hood as a suffix for a lot of things, like um, statehood, personhood. Um, we put hood on lots of things. And that's because it had a very wide use in Old English. But if we keep reading, we have rach, which is a verb we'll come back to. And we have fold buendra. Fold is that word for land that we saw up here, fold. And then buend. A buend is a dweller. Buon means to dwell, to live in. And end just means someone who does something. It's like the dwelling ones. And then this ra tells us kind of the same information that this a on huera did and this a on halada did, which is just among them or of them of a plural. So it's like land dwellers and it's of land dwellers. So they're the hadas, the probably shapes or forms or bodies of land dwellers. This is another way of saying people um, in a more poetic way that fills the line out. So, and then our verb is urech, and this is the past tense of ureon. Um, I'll just keep saying of instead of among <laughs> instead because among has some new connotations in English that it didn't used to have. So, of their number, <laughs> let's say. Um, reach is the past tense of the verb reon, which means to cover. It is actually, I think, related to the word wreath. Um, a wreath, like a wreath that you put around your tree. Um, <laughs> uh, so around, you know, the winter holidays, a lot of people put wreaths around their, on their doors or just hang them up around. And a wreath, um, is, you know, a round thing that you cover, like usually it's branches of something that you cover with, you know, different things, ribbon, holly, um, other things. Um, and reon, the sort of root there, means to cover or to adorn. It can also mean to twist. I think it's related to wiyan. I think that means to twist, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so it's kind of those those sorts of things, wrapping things up. Reon. Um, so this is the past of that. So before, wrapped up or surrounded or covered the bodies, the forms of folk dwellers, of people. So I think what's happening here is this isn't I have. This is one may have, because it's a hypothetical, one may have me on a back, on their back, who before um, covered the forms of of folk, of land dwellers, fold buendra, fold dwellers, land dwellers. Flash and whoa, I did not mean to zoom out there. Let's zoom in. 
Sh again. Uh, here we go. Flash. That's an S C, so it's gonna be a sh again. Flash, and gastas. So flash, and that is flesh. Um, and it means flesh, like it does now. And not much change has happened to that word flesh. Um, and then we have this little seven look, seven looking and here. Flash and gastas. This G. This is ash, the A E combined. S T. And here they're not doing the S T, you know, ligature. They're not combining the S T. They've just written it out. The scribe is kind of going back and forth with that. Here they did astian together with the S T, but then they wrote strong, strong without it. So they're just kind of going back and forth. It's a style thing. Um, everyone has little weird things they do with their handwriting, so this scribe would be kind of doing something um, with that. But gast us, gast. Um, it is where we get the word ghost. Um, it's also related to gust, like a gust of wind. Um, so gast, in this context, usually it means soul, like the spirit of someone. Because a ghost is just someone's soul, and the soul is connected to wind, just like the word spirit is connected to the word uh, respiration, the spire. You might respire by breathing. Expire, breathe out. Inspire, breathe in. Um, you might breathe life into someone's idea by inspiring them. So uh, in Latin, which is where all those words inspire, spirit, there's a connection between breath and souls. And the same is true in Old English. So gast can mean a soul or a spirit or a ghost. So flesh and spirits, um, or souls, flesh and souls. Um, somod, somod on sunda. Somod means together. It's related to sama, which means same, which I don't think we're going to see anywhere in, in here. But somod means together. So together on sunda. Sund means a sound, um, not sound that you hear, but sound like a body of water. And um, this is where the word sound comes from. Um, but in Old English, sunda could just mean any any sort of bay or area of water. So sunda, and especially in poetry, it just can mean water in general. So together in the water. Um, then we have saga. And saga is a command. It means say. Imperative. So as a command. Say. They're tell the, the answer of the riddle is telling us to say. Um, Sara hua mekthecha o the hu ich hata thetha last bera. Okay. So say hua is like who or what, depending on the gender of the answer. <laughs> um, say what thecha mek. So what fetches me. Thechan means, it's another word that means to cover, like ureon is up here, ureach. It's related to the word thatch, like you might have a thatched roof. Thechan means to cover, roof something. We also had another word for roof, it was hrevan. Uh, yeah, yehrevet, roofed. But here's another word, to, th to thatch. Say what covers me. Otha, and otha means or. Um, otha, who. Each. How I. Who is how. H-U. That's how you spell it in English. Who. How. How I. And then hata. Hata means to be called. Or it's the I form. So it's I am called. Say what covers me. Or how I'm called. Like say what I am. Solve the riddle. <laughs> Basically. That's what they're saying. Say what covers me. Or, um, or what I'm called, the the last bera. That which, so the is another way to say that when you're connecting clauses. That and tha can mean that thing or which. It all kind of depends on the gender here, and I think it's plural here, so it's tha. Last, a last is a load, like a load that you would carry, like a. A boat might carry a load from one place to another. It would be a last. Um, but here, I think it's plural. It's the last. The, the loads. 
and bera means to bear, to carry. So that which carries load. So that's the entire riddle. So let's go over it one more time and see if we can figure out what this riddle is. And I will provide a hint once we also go through the whole riddle. So we got through the first poem. So we've got which is halatha thas horsh and thas hiya krafti that that maya asejan. Uh, which, um, which is the thing that the wise or the, um, the sort of mentally crafty um, among heroes may say? Um, what is that thing? What is it? Um, who sends me on a path? Um, who may urge me on a path? Really, uh, when I rise up strongly, um, at times fearful, I thunder powerfully. Um, I may. Uh, urge at times. I go over the land. I burn the houses or the halls of folk. I plunder buildings. Smokes r rise up gray over the roofs. Um, there's a commotion on the earth, the sudden death of men. When I, uh, when I stir or disturb the woods, uh, the quick sprouting groves, the full trees. Um, the full trees um, roofed on over on the waves uh, with high powers to urge on um, a journey or a hunt uh, sent widely. Uh, one may have me on their back, uh, that uh, before covered the bodies uh, or the forms of folk, or I'm um, sorry, not folk, uh, fold dwellers, land dwellers. So before covered or wrapped around the bodies of land dwellers. Um, flesh and souls together on this on the sea or on the water. Say what what um, covers me or how I am called, that which carries the load. Okay, that is the whole riddle. Um, as best as we can understand it, if I were referring to a translation, I would probably smooth out some of the weird grammar stuff. Um, I'm probably just forgetting some forms, um, so it sounds a little awkward. Um, but there's the grammar in these poems is also notoriously weird, even for Old English, even for Old English poetry. Uh, people... Uh, it's, a, it's sort of a second layer to riddles. It's the riddle is a riddle, but also understanding the riddle is a riddle. Um, but hopefully, um, people might have some ideas of what the answer could be. But before we give ideas, I'm going to give a hint here. So my hint is that um, the first set of poems, uh, like I think the first dozen or so, something like that, um, those first poems um, in among the riddles tend to be nature related so it's some kind of natural phenomenon or um, thing in nature um, so maybe that's a hint although i feel like that possibly could have been guessable just from uh, what we read but i want to know if anyone in the chat has ideas for what the answer to the riddle could be I also have um, a second hint if people want more detailed hints, but I think the second hint might give it away a little bit more. Does anyone in chat have ideas for what the answer might be? I'm curious. All right. Um, okay, fire. Fire is a, um, a theory someone just put forward. Okay, so let's see, does fire work here? Um, I think um, uh, I think the thing that suggests that the most is when it says, you know, there's, um, I journey over the land, I burn people's halls. Um, <laughs> Yeah, maybe theory is the wrong word, but um, hypothesis, I don't know. Guess. <laughs> I think guess is really the right word. Um, 
All right, so I burn people's halls. It says straight out, I burn people's halls. I plunder the building. Um, fires, you know, smokes go up. <laughs> Thesis. Okay. Um, fires go up. So there, there is some talk about, or sorry, not fires, smokes go up. So um, that would be a good sort of explanation for this part. Um, and I know the, the person who shared this said, um, they're just trying to get kind of maybe an obvious answer out of the way. Um, uh, I don't think fire works throughout the entire riddle, though. Uh, it doesn't really urge... I mean, it could urge someone on their path by, like, threatening them. <laughs> um, it can rise up strongly. Um, so that's also a good thing. It can thunder. It could be loud, like the crackling of the fireplace that you might hear in the background of the stream. Um, but... When we're talking about rustling the leaves, or like rustling the, not the leaves, the trees, there's no talk of burning the forest. And so if this is fire and it's disturbing the forest, um, or not really disturbing, but stirring the forest, we would maybe expect it to burn the forest down. Um, and also, uh, it wraps around the bodies of people, um, flesh and soul. That might also suggest a sort of maybe a funeral pyre or something so that it's not a bad theory um it can fit in a lot of places but the hint i was going to give is that this sort of burning here is probably not burning so this this is something i probably should have talked about before which is why i feel like it's a fair hint to give um so it means to burn just like the modern english word means burn however it also has a flavor that the modern english word can have where it's not necessarily burning from heat but burning from cold as well. Um, now, the fact that smokes go up afterwards <laughs> would probably push you to the opposite of that and think maybe it's heat because, you know, smokes are going up over the roofs of the buildings. Um, but my hint is that this actually is about, uh, probably about cold um, burning. Um, the fact that there are smokes going up this may be like just a consequence of the fact that whatever the answer is, is causing people to be cold. Um, so um, maybe that gives um, another, maybe that gives you some more ideas. So if anyone in the chat wants to maybe guess, um, so it's, it's probably not fire. Um, fire kind of works for some of these things like um, wrapping around people's flesh and souls. Maybe if you're cremating someone, although cremation was not, the most common way of burying people in the Anglo-Saxon period. Um, usually it was burial. Um, but it could. Um, and it could, you know, describe burning buildings and stuff and cause smokes. But um, most scholars are pretty sure that it's not fire. Fire is not the answer to this one. Any other ideas? All right, snow, okay, or winter more generally. Um, that is actually closer to the answer. So um, the answer that most scholars give, so that I'm going to count that. That's really, that's pretty um, good. Winter especially is like kind of the answer. So scholars actually do have a little bit of debate about the precise answer, but it's somewhere between like wind and winter. Some people say storm in general, um, but winter and wind are probably the strongest, especially when we talk about um, it being like high, the high power over the waves um, sent widely. So uh, wind or winter, cold weather, bad weather, that's sort of the sort of range of this one. And actually the next few... Um, riddles like the first three or four have basically the same answer of like stormy snowy winter all kind of fit as the answer so yeah winter i think is a very good answer for this one because it burns you know the houses of the folk by making them cold and as a result people will set fire so smokes rise gray over the roofs um there's you know commotion on the earth um, the sudden death of men, you know, the, the winter can cause people to freeze <laughs> or just like generally not survive. Um, 
and the winter or the wind of winter comes in it rustles the leaves it um it disturbs or stirs the woods the quick growing trees um so it kind of disrupts things um and it goes over widely like the wind does uh, the wind kind of sends you on your path it urges you forward it blows you <laughs> over and it surrounds people flesh and spirit um it wraps around the bodies of people. Um, so, um, excellent job. This is this is probably one of the harder riddles to start with, even though I just wanted to start with it because it's the first one. So, um, good job to chat for trying to answer this one, and that was pretty that was pretty good. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and skip forward to riddle number. S I don't know if we should do six or seven with the time we have left. We have about an hour and 12. Oh wait, no, we have more than that. We have an hour and, what is it? An hour and 44 minutes? Yeah, we have time for more. Um, in that case, I think seven is a little harder than six. So let's go ahead to go to six. So six is on page two, uh, 102 verso, um, and it goes on to 103 recto. So I'm gonna go up and go next. So I'm gonna go on 102 verso and try to find where this one begins. So it goes on to 103 um, recto, so it's probably the last one on the page. Um, there we go. Oh, question. Someone have a question? Um, yes, so I missed it. I did my math wrong. I have 43 minutes left. Um, not an hour and 40 minutes left, sorry. Um, I was looking at the clock wrong, yeah, thank you. Um, I end at 8 uh, Pacific, so 8 p.m. Pacific. So, yeah, about 40 minutes left. So I still think it would be best to go to um, Riddle 6 because it's a bit easier than 7. Yeah, I love math, too. <laughs> no, I, I just I just looked at the clock, clock wrong. Um, yeah, okay, so we're going to be at the bottom of 102 Verso, and I'm going to zoom in. And we're going to take a look at the poem. And I don't think I'm going to go all the way through once this time because it goes over pages, and that's kind of tricky. Actually, for this one, I might do double page view, actually, um, just so I can easily like slide back and forth. Yeah, there we go. Oh, no. We're not on the right page anymore. That's recto. Two, 102 versa. There we go. Oh, yeah, it goes all the way to up here, I think, where it says... Uh, Beton. Oh yeah, there's some weird spelling here too. Okay, um, so let's let's go ahead and just read the first part um, to where maybe we can see the first sentence ends, and I think it ends. Here. Okay, I'll stop here where it says bad or not because I think that's where the first kind of clause ends. Okay. Oh, farewell. Um, someone just signed off. Okay. So, um, next riddle, uh, is, this is riddle six. Um, so we're still, um, if you want, uh, information that might still help you get some hints to the answers here. Um, we're still in the section where most of the answers have to do with things in nature. Um, so we can keep those in mind as we're um uh going through this so first we have the first sentence and i'll just read the first sentence it says um uh mek yeseta sof siora waldend christ to compa oft each quicker barna um actually i could probably stop at compa oh yeah because okay i'm gonna go one more time sorry yeah so mek yeseta Solv siora, waldend Christ to compa. Okay, and what I didn't really touch on before is the, these capital letters. So you'll notice capital letters are not very common, and it's really hard to tell where one sentence ends and the next begins. Um, you kind of just have to use context, because um, they also don't really use punctuation very much. So what helps you find where like paragraphs end and start is that's usually where you're going to have a capital and it's going to be a little bit more elaborate and nice looking. So this says each um, up here. 
but this is mech here, and this is fancy M, mech. Um, a lot of capital M's kind of have this curve to them a lot. Um, they kind of look like an upside down, um, more like an upside down, not a W, but like an upside down omega, if you've ever seen the lowercase omega. Um, this kind of looks like that. So, mech, yeseta soth siora, walden de Christ to compa. So mech, this is mech again. Again, a lot of the times the E's kind of go above when they're attached to the next letter because the scribe doesn't want to lift the pen. So this is mech, me, yeseta. And this ye, um, this is often used with past tense verbs. It could also be used with present tenses to show like things happened in a together-y kind of way. It's very vague kind of emphasis marker thing. But with the past, it usually emphasizes that something is completed. So instead of saying like, uh, so this is the verb setan, which means to set, and it's in the past tense, so set, someone set me, um, like set me down in the past, but with the ye in front of it, this is more like has set me, like it's complete, it's done. If someone set me, someone has set me, um, sof siora waldend Christ tokompa, okay. Solf, here, solf means true. Um, if you've ever heard of the term soothsayer, a soothsayer is like usually like someone who's giving prophecies. Sooth means truth. Um, if you ever have read like Shakespeare, you might have seen the word forsooth. That just means like for sure, it's true, um, indeed. Um, so solf means true. Um, in Old English prayers, if you ever like reciting a prayer, where we would nowadays just borrow the um, Hebrew word amen. Uh, in Old English, they would say solvlicha, which means truly. Uh, truly. Um, it's how you usually end a prayer in Old English. Um, so solv is true. So true, and we've got sigora waldend Christ tokompa. So sigora means, um, so sia uh, means a uh, victory. Um, uh, Sigurd can also mean victory. Um, and I think this is Sigurd of victories. And then, I might be mistaken, but I know that this ultimately is going to mean victory. I just don't remember exactly the form that this is. Um, and then we have Waldend. Waldan, uh, this is actually the word Waldan that this comes from. Waldan means to be in control, or to have, or to own. Um, it's where we get the word wield from. When you wield something, you're in control of it. Um, so a waldend is the wielder, or the one who is in control. And waldend is a really common way in Old English to like, to, to express the idea of like lord. Um, usually it refers to God in a Christian context, um, if it's being used in a Christian context. Um, so waldend often just can translate as like the lord. <laughs> or something like that. Drichten is the more kind of often used word for Lord, Drichten. Um, but Walden is sort of like the, the one in control, <laughs> the almighty, uh, we might say. Uh, and then we have Christ here. C-R-I, and that's the S-T combined there. So Christ means Christ, and it's just Jesus. They, do, they just don't have the H in Christ. The H is there as a relic from how Latin transcribes Greek. <laughs> In Greek, it's the letter that looks like X. It's um, what we call chi in modern English. It's ki. Um, so it's Christos. In modern Greek, it's Christos. Um, but that's usually written C-H in Latin. But in Old English, they just said Christ with just a C. C-R-I-S-T. Christ. So, um, Christ, I think, so siora wild and Christ is the subject. So the true, you know, lord of victory Christ set me to comp. So comp here, comp means combat or battle, and it's borrowed from the Latin word campus, uh, which means field or battlefield. Um, it's also where we get the word campus from. And camp. But in Old English, when you see it, it just means like combat or conflict. Um, so, uh, so the the sort of true. Almighty Lord of victory, Christ, has set me to battle, into battle. 
All right, so that's kind of the first sentence. So the me in question again is whatever the answer to, answer to the riddle is. Sent me to battle. Often, so that's oft, oft ich quicker barna un rimu kin um, erthan yetenja. Um, I think I'll stop there. Okay, so oft is oft, like often. We could even say oft in really sort of archaic sounding English, but oft is often. Oft ich quicker barna un rimu kin erthan yetenja. Okay. So often I quicker barna. So that's barna again. We had that in the first riddle. Burn. I burn. Often I burn. Quicker. And quicker is the plural of quick. And quick in Old English, C win I C. Uh, quick means alive, actually. Um, in modern English, quick, Q U I C K, means like fast. But originally it meant alive. And um, so the alive and then it's plural so alive so the living is what you might say uh, often i burn the living and then we have un rimu kin so that in un here is un like the prefix un and then rimu here um so this rim and then the u is just making it plural uh rim means count r i m rim uh so count and so this would be like uncounted in the plural and then kin. And yes, this is that unfortunate Y that looks really weird, like an F again. Um, but yeah, that's Y. Kin. C-Y-N. Usually there are two N's here. But sometimes they just write with one N. And this is the word kin. Um, K-I-N in modern English. And it means, you know, people, folk. Um, in modern English, kin usually means family. Um, and it does have that kind of connotation in Old English too, like people who are related. But um, it could just mean like your, your clan, your tribe, your your town, people in general. So this is like uncounted people, basically. Uh, so uh, the almighty lord of victory, the true almighty lord of victory, Christ, has set me in battle. He's put me in, up to uh, some kind of war I have to fight. I often burn the living, uncounted um, people, Eorthan Yetenja. So Eorthan means like earth and it's like on the earth this is like a sort of form of earth uh, marked for something and then we have this word yetenja and yetenja is a very tricky word to get the hang of it can mean like pressed down onto or oppressed in some way pushed down onto um but it can also just kind of mean nearby some kind of place if you have a place or it can mean hanging over <laughs> A place so it really has a wide meaning it's basically like adjacent to but with different connotations depending on the situation here yetenja and that's t uh, that's the g e t e n g e and you might notice there that i pronounce the g like a j sound um usually y this would be like a y yetenya but after an n if you would have something that would otherwise be like a y sounding g it ends up being more like a j which is also what we had when we had a CG, was J, like in Sejan. So this is Yetenja. Um, so sort of pushed down onto the earth or oppressed on the earth. So an uncountable amount of people oppressed to the earth or pushed down on the earth. Um, okay, let's keep going. So now we've got Nata, Nata Midnitha. And now um, Nata, that's the verb Natan. And I had to look this one up because I'd never seen it before. It's a very rare poetic word. Natan means uh, to crush. Um, so this is kind of the same idea. Pushed onto the earth, cr I crush mid nitha. Mid means with. M I D. Mid means with. Um, there is a word with in Old English, win, I, thorn. <laughs> um, but with in Old English means just against. It would only mean like when you fight with someone, you're fighting against them. Whereas mid, if you fight mid someone, they're on your team. Um, you're fighting alongside someone versus fighting against someone. So there was actually a difference between with against and with on the same team as. And that distinction is pretty useful. So in old English, it's mid. So um, here, a, like crush with and then neither. Now neath is like violence or hatred or um, contempt. 
and so it, and it's just marked for a specific case that shows that it's with it. So crush with violence <sighs> or oppress with violence. Again, it can also mean oppress instead of just crush. Um, but we've already kind of got like press to the earth, oppress, I oppress with violence. Swa ich him no krina. Okay, this is interesting. Swa ich him no krina. Swa is where we get the word so from. It's like S W A, but I mean, whenever I say W, it's win. Really, they don't use W, but it, that's that's the sort of pronunciation of it is W S W A. Um, swa. It means so. It can mean as, or it can mean like while something else is the case. Um, but mostly, it's as or so. Like as something as you might say swa swa something. Swa, blah, 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 swa. Or you could say swa, swa, blank, swa, blank. Uh, so often it gets repeated multiple times as well. But swa here, it's just swa. Swa, each, I, him. Him um, doesn't necessarily mean him here. It can mean just, it can mean it as an object, an uh, indirect object as well. And it can also be them as well, because the form is the same. So it can be them. And I think here it's them, the uncounted people. As, I, them. No, this is no, and no does not mean no, actually. Um, I mean, it means no sometimes, but usually the word for no, to say no, you'd say, you just say ne before the verb. So each ne barna, I do not burn. Each ne barna would be that. I, I don't burn. I burn not. Um, but if you want to say no to a question, you'd either say na, usually na, or neza, depending on what the question is. If it's assumed yes or assumed no. Um, uh, but when we see no and o in Old English, or sometimes na as well, um, that actually means never. It's kind of a conflation of the word ne, and then there's a word awa, or just a, which meant, sometimes it's wa or awo, depending on the dialect, it means ever. So this is not ever, or never. So no means never. Never, and then hrina. This is the verb hrinan. Hrinan means to touch. Swa ich him no hrina, as I never touch them. All right, let's pause there and go back to go over the whole riddle now. So, the true almighty, uh, lord of victories, Christ, set me to battle. Often I burn the living. Um, uncounted people uh, pushed to the earth, I crush with violence as I never touch them. So whatever the answer to the riddle is, is somehow like oppressing people, pushing them to the earth without touching them and it's burning them. Okay. If you have ideas already, you can like hold it because I don't want to have people guess yet, but we'll keep going. So then we have thona again, then or when. Thona mek min fra felchtan hateth Huilum um, ich monigra mold areta. Okay, that was a lot. So, um, thona, we've got thona mek min freya theochtan hateth. Okay. So, then, or when, let's see, it probably it could be then or it could be when. Often it's when. So, when me. Min freya. Min is just my, mine, my. And then fra is lord, like the lord over you, the person who commands you is often fra. There are a lot of words for lord in Old English, but fra is one of them. Fra is also probably the name of a deity um, that in Norse, the Norse pantheon was called Freyr or um, Ingvi. In Old English, he's also called Ing. Um, but it just means Lord, uh, just like Freyr means Lord, and um, or it comes from the word for Lord in Old Norse. Um, but it refers to that. Um, I think it, it can refer to that same deity in context where that's possible, but there's not a lot of pagan Old English texts. Um, we could get into that someday if people are interested. Um, so yeah, min Freya, theochtan hateth. So when my Lord, theochtan hateth mek. So, Feochtan, Feochtan means to fight, and that's why there's a GH in fight, because there's this H here. Feochtan, to fight. 
Hateth means, uh, we actually saw this at the end of um, the last riddle. It said, Saga uh, Hua Mekthecha, Otha Hu Ich Hate, with two Ts, and that meant how I call myself. So Hatan actually means to call, but it can also mean to command. So here, when my Lord commands me to fight, notice how the word order is just kind of all messed up. We have to use the grammar. Um, I'm kind of using the endings here to tell me what's doing what. So I know Min Freya is the subject because there's no special ending on Freya or on Min. So that's the subject. I know Mech is the object because that's the form for the object. Um, I know Fertan is like to do this because it's not. The A-N is kind of the default ending for an infinitive. So it's to fight. And then Hateth, this Eth is telling me that a third person, so probably my lord, is the one who's commanding. So my lord, when my lord commands me to fight, well, so my lord is probably Christ, because Christ is the one who set me to fight, the me being the answer to the riddle. <laughs> so when my lord uh, commanded me to fight, or called upon me to fight, or summoned me to fight, they, they, those are all appropriate translations of Hatan here, huilum ich monigra mold arete. Um, so I think this is actually a completely new sentence. And this, when my lord calls me to fight, is actually um, going back to the prior stuff. So if we stop at hateth, again, there's no punctuation to tell us this, but now that I'm reading it, I think it should stop here. So um, the true almighty uh, lord of victories, Christ, has set me to battle. Often I burned living, uncountable, or uncounted people uh, pressed to the earth, I oppress with violence, though I never touch them when my Lord commands me to fight. So this kind of links back to the to compa here, to the battle here. All right, then I think this is kind of a non sequitur. This kind of goes into another description to help us figure out what this thing is. Huilum, huilum, this W or H W I L is huil. Huil is where we get the word while from, like W-H-I-L-E, while. Um, and it, huil just means a period of time, or just the word time as well. It's one of the many words for time in Old English. Um, we saw a few on the last riddle, actually. So huilum is um, at times, or sometimes. Huilum. So at times, at whiles, we might say. Each monigra mold areta. So I... Let's skip over this word because our verb is actually over here. Areta. Aretan means to comfort someone. Um, there isn't really a descendant of this word anymore. We don't have it. But aretan means to comfort someone. So I comfort monigra mold. Mold. This is where we get the word mood from. But mold in Old English means a lot of different things. But mostly it's anything to do with your capacity to think or feel um so it's kind of it kind of makes sense that it means mood in english the way that we use the word mood um but it can be like your mind your thoughts your soul your heart um people translate it very widely um it gets even com more complicated when we have the word modi if someone's modi um, it sounds like moody and it's where moody comes from but like, that can mean a lot of things like it could mean wise it could mean strong mentally or it could mean um brave <laughs> so mold is a very wide word but i comfort the mind maybe and monigra moni um sometimes it's spelled with an a sometimes an o depends on the dialect so monigra um, moni means many that's where many comes from um and then this ra it makes it um a genitive plural again it means of many so i console or i comfort the mind of many Okay, that's a very different vibe from what we got before. Like, Christ sends me into battle, and I often burn uncounted numbers of people, uh, press them on the earth with violence, um, without touching them when my Lord commands me to fight. Period. At times, <laughs> I comfort the mind of many. Okay, that's kind of a different vibe. Um, and then we have huilum again. Huilum, each frevra, Thaich ar winna. Um, ar winna. There's a dot there, but I don't think that's a complete sentence, actually. Um, let, let's just try to get it without looking at what's on the next page, because I think I think this might be a place where 
the uh, line ends in a weird place. Um, so huilum, so that's at times again. At times I, frevra. Frevran means to console or to comfort. So it's another way of saying the same verb. Um, like I said before, often these poems can be repetitive because they're trying to sound nice, right? Huilum, each monigra mod areta. Huilum, each frevra. Tha each arwina something. So at times I comfort. A tha. Tha is another way of saying when. Each I ar before. We had that before. Winna. Um Winna. Um I really need to know what comes next to understand it. Winna. This win can mean a lot of things. I think my like default association with the word win is that it means like uh, adversarialness. <laughs> Basically, yeah. Uh, if you can say that it was the Lord who told you to do something, <laughs> that makes it, it makes you feel better. Uh, but whatever, we just know that the answer to this riddle, whatever it is, is going to be something from the natural world. So the Lord commanded something in nature to burn uncounted numbers of people and oppress them when it calls them to battle. Okay, um, uh, oh, wait, so it's winna on feoran suida. Okay. He thus fela thus, which, okay. Um, I know how to interpret this better now, so let's go back down to where we were. So, at times, I comfort, um, or I offer comfort, or I console, when I, before, um, winna, so that's kind of, um, in opposition, <laughs> or in strife, a win is like a, a, a conflict. <laughs> um, in modern English, we use the word win to mean, you know, victory. Um, in old English, that's sia or siur. Um, and win was any conflict. But nowadays, when you win, you have, you have, um, you've gained victory over the conflict. But in old English, it's just the conflict itself is win. Any win, any conflict is win. Um, so win on, winna on, Theoran Suida. So, um, any sort of battle um, from very far away. Theoran is far, like from afar. And then Suida is just very. Suida. S W I Thorn. Suida. Um, so, I, at times, I comfort when I. Um, uh, tha. It's a tha each. Ar winna on feron suida. Oh, winna is a verb. Okay, see, this is why I needed to see the rest of it. Winna is a verb. When I strive or I am in conflict from a from very far away. So I might be in conflict far away with whoever the Lord told me to fight, <laughs> but I can still offer comfort sometimes to other people. Um, like um, I offer comfort to many, to the mind of many, uh, is what we saw. Uh, then it says, he thas felath, uh, ther swilcha thas oldres, thona ich eft hira over deo, uh, is that deo piedreach? Deo piedreach drochtath betan. Okay, that's fun. Okay, so, um, I, so we had huilum, it said huilum, um, what did it say? Huilum each frevre, fa each arwina on feoran suida. Uh, at times, I comfort um, uh, when I was before, when I before am in conflict very far away. He thus felath um, ther swilche uh, thus ovres. So, they, he is they. It could also be them. H I. Often it's H I E or H Y, but it really depends on the dialect. Sometimes it's just H I. He. Now the pronoun he, like he and him, that is he in old English. It's H E, uh, and it's spelled like modern English. He. Um, he. But he, H I or H Y, he or he, if it's H I E, means they. Um, and in Middle English, this became a problem the word he and he kind of merged, and so you couldn't tell if something was singular or plural, which wasn't really a problem. It was often context. But 
um, English kind of ended up borrowing the Norse word for they. Um, it was Thayer, Thayer, and Thay, um, or I think it was Thal at the time. It's how it's pronounced, but it's Thay now in Icelandic. Um, and that's where you get the word they from. They, um, largely. There were some old English things that contributed to the word they as well. But um, he means they. They feel. Felath is they feel. So they feeleth. They feel. Felath. Thas. Of that. They feel it. They feel of it. Thach. Thach is where we get the word though from. It's thorn, E A H. Thach. Though. So it's although they feel it, or they feel of it. Swilcha thas odras. Swilcha is like we had huilch before, was which. Swilcha is where such comes from. And it's like in such a way, or at, it's another way of saying as. Like we had swa before for so or as. Um, so swilcha as thas odras. Odras of the other. Of the other. Um, such that of the other. So we have two kind of groups of people. We have people who this answer is oppressing, burning untold numbers of people because the Lord told them to, um, whatever the thing is. And then we have other people who it's comforting at the same time. And they, they though they feel it just as the other, the other group, I guess, um, is what this could be. It's singular, which is interesting. Ovres is singular of the other. Um, so that's a little confusing. Um, but again, I'm just kind of doing this off the top of my head, so um, it could it's going to be confusing. If I had more time with this, um, I would probably try to figure out some of the grammar stuff and figure out what exactly it says in modern English. Uh, so we have thona, then or when, each eft, hira over deop yedreach droch dath beta. Okay, so thona, when or then, each, I, eft can mean like back or again, depending on the context. When I again, hira over deop yedreach. So hira is weird here, because hira means there. So we had they, he, and hira is like there, like belonging to them, um, or of them. So of them, so it's there something, but we have over after it. So this might just be, it's been reordered so that the poetry fits. So on each of eft, eft alliterates with ovras here. Thas ovras. Thona each eft hira over deop yedeach droch dath beta. The alliteration tells you where like the rhythm goes. So here, hira there something <laughs> over deop. And I know that deop is just the word and it ends here. The ye here is attached to deach. It just often gets separated from it, but it's one of those kind of emphasizer words here. But deop is a word and it means deep, over the deep. Um, and then yedreach actually means, um, uh, yedreach is, uh, this is a fun word, um, but I'm not exactly sure how to translate it. Um, there's sort of like two poles of what this word could mean. It can mean, um, on the one hand, it can mean like a group of people, like a multitude, or like a large number of something, but it can also be kind of like that word hlin that had like a contested origin, where it means just kind of like commotion <laughs> or tumult. So it could be a commotion or like a crowd, <laughs> uh, potentially. Uh, and I think it's, um, hira gedrech, their commotion or their crowd, potentially. Let's finish the rest of the sentence. Uh, over the deep uh, commotion or crowd. And then we have this word drochtaf. Uh, so that's a D R O H T A F. <laughs> drochtaf. And drochtaf is another fun word because it means like a billion different things. It's a lot like the word had, where it can mean like condition, situation, form, shape, person, identity, all sorts of things. Drochtaf can be anywhere from like uh, situation or condition uh, all the way to something more fun with like society. It can mean society. Um, it could mean, it can even be like, as specific as like a conversation could be a drochtath, or a topic could be a drochtath. Um, and then betan is the verb for to improve. Betan, it makes something, to make something better, to 
better it, Beitan. Um, but I think there's something weird here where we have each here. Each meaning I, but we don't have a verb that is in the I form. So there's, a, I think this might be actually a scribal error. So there's, there's a thing that happens a lot of the time where um, a word is I, but they'll put the verb with an A-N where they mean to put an E just because words... Like, verbs, when they come at the end, a lot of the time, they tend to be infinitive, so they tend to want to be an. And so I think what happens is the scribe saw what was probably beta in the I form, so each beta I improve or I make better. Um, but they're like, oh, this is the end of a sentence. I'm going to correct that. Um, but they correct something that's not wrong. <laughs> this is the main source of problems in manuscripts, is clearly the scribe is copying from another scribe, and they're not the ones who wrote it, so they don't, like... They're not really thinking when they're copying. They just see something that looks like a typo or an error, and they try to fix it. But them fixing it actually makes it incorrect. Um, I think this is one of those situations, because it happens a lot when you have the I form at the end of a sentence, and that's why I'm guessing that that's what this is, because we're missing a verb. So I, again, improve their... Oh, actually, I think it's hira drochtat, their situation or their society, or whatever, over the deep, it could be multitudes, crowds, population, maybe even, or commotion, over the deep commotion. Okay, and that's actually the end of the riddle, because the next riddle is Chayal Min Suyath. That's actually riddle seven that I was thinking about doing. Um, I guess we'll do that next time if we want to do riddles again. Um, but let's try to solve it. So let's go over what it all means together and see if we can solve what thing in nature um, that this is. Uh, let's see if we can solve the riddle. So, uh, let's go over all of it one more time, um, translating it, and I want to see if people in chat um, can guess the answer once we do that. So, we have Mick Yaseta Solv Sigara Walden Christ Tokompa. Oft ich quicka barna un rimu kin erfan tenja. Nata mit nida swaij him no hina. Sonne mek min freya feltan hateth huilum ich monigra mod areta. Huilum ich frevra tha ich ar winna on feoran suida. Up here, I, I'm just remembering what it said up here. Feoran suida. Um, he thas felath fer. Swilcha thas odres, thona ich eft hira over deop ye der drochtaf uh, beta. And I think this is beta, not beta. Alright, and then let me translate it one more time. So, uh, the true Almighty Lord uh, of victory, Christ, has set me to battle. Often I burn the living untold, uncounted people oppressed upon the earth. I crush with violence while I do not, I never touch them when my Lord commands me to fight. Sometimes I comfort the minds of many. Sometimes I um, offer comfort when I, before, um, am fighting um, in a very far away place. Um, those that feel it, um, although, uh, sorry, no, yeah, it's although they feel it, just as the others, uh, when I, uh, before, uh, improved their condition over the deep crowds. Okay, so there's um, someone in the chat saying no idea. That's totally fair. This is kind of an enigmatic one. The whole point of riddles is to be confusing. Um, wealth. That is an interesting idea. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Um, gluttony. That's another interesting idea. So I think that that could work for the first half. It burns, wealth could burn untold numbers of people and impress them with violence um, without ever touching them. Um, but, um, it, and it can also console people, you know, a wealth can console people. Um, I guess gluttony can too. Um, 
when it's fighting elsewhere, it can still offer comfort to the person there. I don't think the scribe is a Marxist. Um, uh, if we ever get into the rune poems, <laughs> there is some interesting stuff about economics in there. But, um, that I think chat might be interested in. If we ever do the rune poems, that could be fun. Um, but, let's see. Uh, what, um, what I would like to focus here is, um, I, I don't think the answer is wealth. Um, I actually, I know the answer <laughs> to this, this riddle. Um, I wanted to have that beforehand so I could tell people if they got it right. Um, but I think what might help, um, is uh, wealth is seen as a negative thing in Christianity too. Yeah, it, it can be definitely, especially if you are looking from like um, actually a lot of perspective in a lot of ways. Especially excess wealth is viewed negatively, and that, and we see that in some old English stuff too. Like there are old English um, homilies and stuff that talk about that, um, and that's why um, when they talk about even even in Christian times, they kind of retained this idea of lords giving out wealth to their to their like companions they're like people under them um because that transferred over to the christian values as well like a king's job is to make sure the wealth is distributed in in the um whatever area he's ruling over um and so that kind of carried over into the christian period as well where the whole job of the king is to make sure everyone's getting what is due them however of course there was a hierarchy of who deserved what <laughs> Um, there's like a great chain of being of like certain people deserve this much because that's their role in society. Um, and it was a little more rigid. So, but it is true that like excess of wealth, if like one Lord has way too much money and like there's other Lords who don't have anything or their people, like their serfs and stuff are not able to eat, that's seen as an indisparity. And the King's job is to resolve that conflict and say, Hey, we need to distribute this more evenly throughout the kingdom. Um, so yeah. Um, I don't, so the answer is not wealth, although that's a really, I think that's a really cool, insightful idea with this one. Um, but I think one hint I can give is last time we had the word burn, and it was more like burn, like cold. This one is burn hot. This one is more literal burn. Um, so the, the answer is, like, the Lord has set this natural thing in its place and what it does is it burns people when the lord tells it to it burns people upon the earth crushes them to it without touching them without ever touching them but it also provides comfort people are happy to see this thing at times even when elsewhere it might be burning other people <laughs> um, and they feel it just as the others do it might feel the same but in different contexts people might like that it's there and providing comfort or they might hate it because it's burning them more i think literally burning uh would be not not literally in the sense of going up in flames but heat think heat um and it um often improves the situation um this thing in nature um it provides heat it provides comfort but it can also be too hot um and it can improve the situation of people like, people would be sad without it, and then when it comes to where it needs to be, people are like, oh, yay, it's here, whatever the answer is. Um, so I think that's as much of a, a hint as I can give. Um, we have, we, oh, yeah, never mind. Okay, someone had an idea, and they changed their mind when I kept talking. Um, lightning would be cool. I can't remember if there's a riddle that where the answer is lightning, but if there is, I will check. Maybe we could look at it another time. Um, so... Is there anyone else? We only have like a minute or so left. So is there anyone else in the chat who wants to guess? Um, summer? Oh my god, that's, that's like so close to the answer. It's kind of like winter was the last one. Um, the answer is the sun. Just the sun. Yeah, no. Summer Summer's really good because the answer is the sun. Um, yeah. And so um, the idea is like Jesus put the sun in the sky. Not literally, but like, like gave it its task of burning many people <laughs> but also being a comfort to people like people are like thank god the night is over we're safe it's daytime we're happy the sun is out um so yeah summer's a very it's basically the answer um the, the word summer contains the root sun in it so i'm going to count that just like winter um was basically like wind or storm um these are really tricky 
these are really tricky riddles. The whole point is that they're kind of difficult. Um, oh, the person who said that summer said that they thought that. Yeah, it's the sun because <laughs> it improves people's situation a lot of the time. People are like, yay, the sun's out. We say like, oh, the sun has risen. It's a new day kind of thing. So it's good to some people, but other times it's like, it's too much. The sun is too hot. <laughs> um, so that, that's what they mean by like, people feel it the same, whether, you know, I mean, heat will be different, like the temperature will be different, but it's the same sun if you're in two different locations. But, you know, if you're working hard in the fields, the hot sun is going to feel a lot different than if you had a really bad night and then you woke up and it's daytime and you're happy the sun's out. So it's like two different people can feel the same sun, but it could be positive or negative depending on their situation. And that's actually the kind of thing that we'll see a lot if we ever look at the rune poems as well. They talk about like the duality of things a lot in the rune poems. So um, that's the end of uh, the Yester Lore today, uh, Riddles. Um, the next one is same time, 5.30 to 8 p.m. Pacific next week. Um, I'm not sure yet if I'm going to do riddles again or if I might try something else. We could do more riddles. There are more riddles that could be fun. Um, and maybe we'll go a little bit quicker next time. Um, I won't maybe spend as much time trying to talk about each word and instead kind of just translate it and then we can do it. Uh, we can try to figure it out. Um, but um, if we want to try something else, I was thinking of maybe doing rune poems. Um, the rune poems are pretty fun because they have kind of similar things. They're not quite riddles because they start with the answer usually, uh, but they're just describing an idea and talking about the duality of things. Um, we could we could do more riddles. We could do the rune poems. Um, or we could read a more of a prose text, something a bit easier um, that's not poetry to kind of see how easy in comparison Old English could be. Uh, compared to this very difficult Old English grammar. Poetry in any language is usually going to be harder than the just normal writing. So we could, I might choose something a little bit easier. And maybe we could do both. We could do maybe one more riddle and then do something else. I will, um, I don't know where I could do this because I can't really make this announcement on Twitch. But um, I guess I'll, if people have suggestions of what they would want us to do, whether they want to do more riddles or they want to do something different in Old English, or we could do a different language. We could do Old Norse or Middle English or something, or we could look at Gothic maybe. Um, though Gothic stuff is basically going to be the Bible. <laughs> um, so it's not as um, widely interesting to everyone. Um, but um, my, uh, I have contact on Twitch. I have a, my Discord gamer tag is there. Um, uh, do you have anything that's like how people would talk normal back then? Yeah, so I think if I chose something that was more prose, like um, something that just describes an event rather than in poetry, that would be a little bit closer to how people spoke. Um, I can even maybe find some things about like classroom stuff. I think we have some transcripts of like a classroom, like teacher responding to students. That might be actually really fun to look at. Um, that's a good suggestion. So we could maybe do that. And if that doesn't take the whole time, we can do maybe one more riddle quickly or something. Uh, that's a really good suggestion, actually. I'm going to write that down. Um, like, more like average speech Old English. So we can kind of hear what it sounds like, too. Um, so yeah, a text that's more reflecting how people spoke. Yeah, there are, there are quite a few that we can choose from. I'll try to pick something fun. Um, there are a lot of things I could choose from. So um, I guess just if, if you want to contact me, my gamer tag on Discord is available on my Twitch bio. And so if you have questions, you can um, contact me that way um, and give suggestions for what the next Yesterler will be. I'm mostly going to be doing Old English stuff at first or Middle English or Old Norse, but I might branch out to do other stuff as well. Um, just any kind of old, ancient, or medieval things that have some kind of thing I could share in and that we can do something interactive with. Um, so that is, that's kind of what this is about. So my next broadcast... Um, a receipt or message between friends. Yeah, we could look at something like that too. Maybe not in Old English. If I can find something in Old English, that would be cool. But um, there's lots of other languages we could look at for that kind of stuff. So yeah, definitely good suggestions. Uh, like things like receipts or messages between friends is what the chat said. Um, yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, if you want to contact me, you can find my gamer tag, um, my Discord gamer tag on my Twitch um, information, um, and you could look at my schedule there. The next um, stream is going to be tomorrow from, um, it's, I believe it's 3 p.m., either 3 or 3.30, I can't remember. 
it's on the it's on the schedule. Three or three thirty p.m. Um, Pacific to seven or seven thirty p.m. It's one of the two. <laughs> I'll just double check real quick. Um, so I can make sure that's accurate information I'm sharing. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. It's in settings. I'm still getting used to Twitch, so thank you for bearing with me while I'm waiting for things to load and stuff. Um, I should have my schedule memorized at this point, but I'm sorry I don't. <laughs> um, channel, and then it's schedule. That's where I want to look here. So it's going to be tomorrow. Um, yeah, tomorrow, 3.30 to 7 p.m. Pacific. So if you look on Twitch, it'll be localized to your time zone so you can know when that is. And that's going to be the next con line with me. It'll be session uh, five. So I'll start with like a review of the con line stuff we've done so far in the con line. And then we'll just kind of proceed with talking about more of the con line. Um, and then ne the next Yester lore, the next of this kind of thing, will be next Friday, same time, 5.30 to 8 p.m. Pacific. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, thank you for everyone who commented in the chat, um, and to the future people who might be watching this recording. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, I hope you had some fun looking at some old English riddles. <laughs> um, hopefully we can do more of this in the future. And I hope everyone has a good night, morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time it is when you're watching this. Um, good night and goodbye. <laughs>